Um, I'm going to speak about the construct of nature connection and why it's relevant to what we do. The word reconnecting has come up. It came up with Steph in the very beginning. It's come up at various points. And I just want to explore a bit what that is potentially. And um, maybe you can think about what does it look like? What does it feel like? What are the indicators? How do we know when we've made it? So just very briefly, I'm going to race through this just to paint some context. Mental health and nature, the crisis of our time, probably the two biggest ones are the mental health crisis, the planetary health crisis, and they have one thing in common, and it's people's relationship with the rest of nature. You might call that one health, where one feeds the other. The human species isn't doing so well. We're bombarded by a load of issues at the moment, um, and it's really come out now post-COVID. Cognitive, emotional, social, physical, and that's on the back of that is our desensitisation and degradation of our natural environment. Um, now the climate effects on that, a report from eco-psychologist Gareth Barnard, a whole big report on the climatic effects on mental health. Shifting baselines is a huge thing also with our connection with nature, as, um, as Kyle referred to at the beginning, and, and of course our socioeconomic fluid that we're swimming in. So it's a real convergence of crises. Some figures here, um, 27 trillion rand, I mean these are almost meaningless figures in terms of cost of, of uh, mental health to the global economy expected to increase sixfold by 2030. 36 billion of loss of productivity in South Africa, that was already back in uh, 2016 um, through absenteeism. Presenteeism was almost valued at the same amount, that means showing up to work but not functioning. We all know that feeling. Um, and then just this year, uh, the, ment um, the State of Mental Health report, South Africa had the lowest mental health quotient out of 34 countries surveyed. There's a big sample there. And, um, the, and youth was particularly bad um, across the globe, but also in South Africa, with only about one in five youth saying they're actually flourishing. 50% had some sort of depression going on. The researchers suggest that these might be the factors with internet media having one of the biggest temporal correlations and sort of cell phone usage across all countries. So it's a, um, a big culprit along with those other factors. So 50 years of research is showing us that our urban areas are epicenters of chronic, non-communicable non mental health and disease. And mental health um, and modern medicine is struggling to keep up. And it's gotten worse with COVID and climate. So research is knowing, uh, confirming what most of us have probably known for a long time and that nature is good for us. It has profound effects on our health and well-being. But inevitably, those outside of our sphere want the evidence. So what is the evidence? Well, it's been coming thick and fast, all sorts of reviews on health benefits of greenness, um, uh, green and blue spaces for mental health, uh, reviews on nature contact and human health, how might these pathways work, and so on. And so you have big reviews like this, looking at the benefits, listing them all there, and all the reviews that have cited those benefits, just about everything. Then you have papers looking at the pathways, looking at your time in nature, the ingredients that goes in, the physical and psychological states that comes out of that, and then your health, uh, your health outcomes. I'm, well, I'm happy to send you any of these papers if you want. And then you have these um, clever researchers who put all this together and look at mechanisms and, and how exposure to nature, the contact, the dose, the modifiers of all this works out. Important to note that it also helps planetary health and well-being, uh, and well-being at the end there. A paper that got a lot of coverage worldwide was this one that 100, this, this surveyed 20,000 people, I think mainly in the UK, that 120 minutes in nature is associated with good, and, um, good health and well-being. That's per week. And that was a hard limit. If you didn't get that, you didn't get the benefits. If you did way more than that, the benefits weren't that much more. You can level some critiques at that, but it was an interesting paper nonetheless. And then COVID, there were a whole lot of studies done through, during COVID that people who had access to green space during COVID had less um, uh, mental health impacts. And this paper published on the CDC website says that for future pandemics, we need to keep green space accessible for mental and physical health during COVID and other pandemics. So it's an essential service. We had a lot of talk about what an essential service was. This paper just come out two months ago. I think you might find it quite interesting. A whole lot of economic value done on um, what visiting parks does in terms of gross national product and all the rest. But I want to really focus attention to the last two uh, lines there that park visits had two times more beneficial effect for unhealthy visitors than healthy visitors. And the economic value of park visitation um, far outweighed the economic value for private tourism development. 
and that's just come out now. So that's probably been a shifting space. I watch this. Um, I watch this space. So the World Health Organization, bless them, in 2017 said green space can deliver positive health, social and environmental outcomes and very few, if any other, public health interventions can achieve all of this, especially the impact on active lifestyles, mental health being and social interaction. So there are issues. We're lacking random control trials in this space. We're lacking dose response. How much nature for what outcomes? What type of nature for what outcomes? And we're lacking global south representation. A lot of this work is done in the global north. If you haven't heard of a weird cultures, you should. This works on the back of Joseph Heinrich and colleagues. What is weird? Western, educated, industrial, rich and democratic cultures. And it basically blows apart a lot of the research, especially in psychology, where most of it's been done on weird cultures. And they did a, a range of perceptual studies to show that as Westerners, we're actually the odd one out. And it shouldn't be surprising because our culture is so far removed from the social setting which we evolved that we should not be surprised to find out that we're oddities. So big question in my mind is, should the culture that's potentially so disconnected from nature be the one that's measuring it and setting the baseline? So what's nature connectedness? What makes it distinct from contact with nature? If you've heard me present before, if you're here, talk to me <laughs> more than a few minutes, I'm saying this line quite often. It's not just contact with nature, it's the nature of the contact. So nature connectedness has a number of, well, firstly, uh, firstly, just find out what it is. It's, now it's a personal thing. It's not good to put a definition on it, it's a relationship. How do you define your relationship with your family? So, but I had to do it for my PhD, so it was something like this. A consistent state of awareness that, um, that unites symbiotic thoughts, feelings and direct experiences into traits that support everyday actions that nurture and respect our interrelatedness with the rest of life. There's a distinction here I won't go into between state of connection and traits of connection. A state is, uh, it felt good, we can have lots of states, but is it actually becoming a trait of connection that we actually care and have concern for the environment? So it really combines a worldview, experience and place-based relationships as Vanessa was alluding to. And also a distinction between being in nature and being with nature. This, this uh, can be quite a distinction there. So it's a burgeoning field of applied research. The papers are multiplying. Um, there's a lot of health benefits associated with connection that's not just with contact alone. And it's got far greater relevance to post-COVID impacts and sustainability development goals and what have you. Um, the... Um, yeah, before I just go on, there's something I just wanted to say um, as a metaphor, I think it's quite useful. If you are prescribed um, to go to the gym, for example, there's an assumption that you're not just going to walk around the gym and check the equipment or maybe just touch that treadmill or that bike. There's an assumption you're going to engage with it and you're going to engage with it in a particular way. And there's also an assumption potentially um, if you've been prescribed formally that you're going to engage with a health coach is actually going to give you a routine of how you can best maximise your 30 minutes at the gym. We need to start thinking like that with nature a bit more. And I'll get into that in a moment. But anyway, it says distinct um, benefits with connectedness. Over and above contact, connection has been found to be better at uh, regulating our emotional and nervous systems, has a greater mental resilience, like a fund of calm during stressor events. It enhances eudaimonic well-being, and that's the sense of a worthwhile life, um, of life satisfaction, of meaning, of purpose. So other, most of our well-being is hedonic. We just chase the next happiness hit. And it has, uh, um, it's shown to be four times greater at creating a sense of a worthwhile life than socioeconomic status. But footnote, Global North. Um, Pro-nature and pro-social behaviours it also supports and distinct happiness benefits. I'm just going to quickly say here, this is a, a very ABC of the emotional regulatory system. Basically, we live our lives between drive, busyness, um, um, pursuit, and that sort of activates our dopamine. That's the hunter state. We're also either in a sort of a threat, anxiety, avoid, fear kind of state. That's very much our cortisol, um, our adrenaline, and we don't really get off that a lot. And social media hacks our dopamine as well for various reasons. Connection sits in the contentment side. It's the stopping, it's the calming, it's the connection. 
um, Nadia says that doing nothing is still work. Well, doing nothing actually does the work as well. So it's about giving ourselves permission to allow that, and that produces oxytocin, opiates, and all sorts of things. We spoke about trauma. I think it was you, Nadia, again. And I'm just thinking about what you're saying, Isaac, about dialogue and engagement. I'm not going to go into polyvagal nerve theory, but I'd love to. But essentially, when we approach any situation, we approach it with a, a different level of arousal. And we approach that situation, if you're an alpha male, um, you might engage with fight very quickly, frustration, irritation, anger, rage. You move towards the threat or you move away. And as the uh, arousal uh, increases, this is why I've got a laser, isn't it? As the uh, uh, arousal increases, we head up. Now, this was never really looked at traditionally in, in um, human physiology, but when it gets too much, the dorsal vagal kicks in and we hit freeze. And a lot of us in freeze states. If you've heard any Gabor Mate, he's really good on this at all. Um, anyway, then we, um, then we come out of that. Now, the point being is that social engagement was the last part of our system to evolve as humans. And it's the first one we go back to to diffuse a situation. So to diffuse a situation, we should really be going back to this. And so that's social engagement, as you were talking about. So in our stakeholder process, it's actually good to watch when are people kicking into their sympathetic system and heading here, and when are we actually trying to stay in this state. And Nature Connection is very good at um, keeping us in this, in this state in, in terms of curiosity, open, uh, openness, compassion, mindfulness, and, and so forth. Five minutes. Um, pathways to connectedness, there's been empirical research done on that, noticing with the senses, seeking beauty, allowing emotions, finding meaning, giving gratitude, embodying reciprocity and compassion, and sharing experiences with others. There are other pathways, but these ones have been validated and they're pretty reliable. And allowing some spaciousness, playfulness and creativity. It's not all just being navel-gazing and being serious. Um, some recent, uh, recent um, um, papers have just come out. I just want to say that, yeah, um, these are meta-analysis and that nature connectedness was more likely to produce pro-nature behaviours and, and um, people were healthier. And soberingly, there was no significant effect of environmental education on connectedness. Now, that's probably traditional environmental education, but it's worth taking note of. Another meta-analysis just off the press last week was looking at we need to understand what sort of nature engagement activities what are the factors that enhance our connectedness? What sort of practices do we design for? And how do we um, design initiatives that engage people with nature in certain kind of ways? And, and do that continuously, not just once off. Oh, I really wanted to speak about this because Ansoir brought up the four quadrants in her presentation. Um, but I just really want to point out that in any moment, there are different ways of looking at our connection with nature. So we can be connected with nature but that could be an experience, it could be a set of behaviours, it could be a certain type of relationship with other beings, it can be a particular role within uh, social ecological systems. So you can feel connected but not acted like you're connected with nature. Um, there's a whole lot of nuance there and this, um, this, this is the same quadrant framework that Ansoir was referring to that we need to look at it from the personal experiences as well as our, um, our collective um, context as well. So we need to tetra mesh the understanding of nature connectedness. Some applications to finish with. Um, we um, just recently we did some training with Cape Nature stakeholder engagement officers ahead of their access week, and we gave them a bit of a crash course on how to facilitate some nature connection experiences because this year's theme for Cape Nature was mental health. Sandparks, take note. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And what really was nice to see was it was out of the comfort zone for some of these guys, and but we got the photos back on the right there, and they actually were using some of what we shared with their um, other groups, which actually um, uh, came to the reserves during Access Week. I'm involved with developing a nature prescriptions program. I think we spoke about that at the beginning, or what I prefer to call nature referrals. So working with doctors to formally prescribe nature. Um, it's happening big globally. It hasn't really come online here, and we want to know, can it work here? So how do formal health practitioners actually work with providers and patients? But there's some issues here. Um, is the healthcare industry, is the healthcare as an industry? Maybe it is. Are they really interested? It's a bit ad hoc. What's the dose model? What's the funding model? And can it do more harm to our connection? There's no part-time nature. Nature works full-time for us and we need to notice it full-time. So um, that sort of thing. In Australia, we're working with colleagues on looking at wellness trails. And I note the irony here that it's an, it's an app-supported program. 
but it uses your geo reference and actually plays audio so you don't have to take your phone out and it gives you these routines to listen so we're developing trails drives zones around hospitals where people can be reminded um, to do certain activities that can help enhance their nature connection and then there's nature connection for deeper processes and this segues on to LZ's talk um, i've been involved with a program and evaluation for spirit of the wild which has been going now for probably about 20 years and it brings on a lot of staff from cape nature from sand parks from nelson mandela uni tracker academy and others and we'll be looking at the effectiveness of that program and enhancing connection and what other benefits come out of it um, we did it for a whole year we're still continuing now and um, it's a very diverse group of participants that enter those um, that that five six day program and um, oh, we had a theory of change I won't go into that now but what I did want to say was the outcomes are profound from that and um, essentially <laughs> I mean people agree fully to everything that what I did for them in terms of their authenticity their sense of health and well-being their ability to manage protected areas um, they are gushing and glowing after the program and it's really about this renewed sense of self um, self-worth confidence uh, capabilities a catharsis that's a big one there's a lot of emotional release for participants in this program realizing potentials there's a deepened sense of interconnection with nature they all report on how much more connected they feel sensory emotionally intuitively and respectful if anyone's been on that program they'll know there's a spiritual element as, as well and um, there's knowledge in the stories that they share so we used a narrative based and we captured people's stories and we coded all the stories so there's knowledge in all those stories but it's often overshadowed by the powerful um, metaphorical symbol uh, symbolical and experiential learning of one's relationship with earth and um, and their encounters with self and others it's a kind of program that is really hard to justify going on you think why bother and then when you're on it and at the end you're saying we should be doing more of this I can't believe we're not doing this more often and as a final word whenever I've been doing train the trainers if you call it that or this kind of program what we're noticing is that the cons this is a training program but so often it's the conservation staff themselves who are saying this is for me I haven't stopped I, I needed this I've been going at it and I didn't realize I was going so hard and um, it was the same with when we were doing the Cape Nature work. It's been saying well, I've been working with nature guides in um, over near Plett. It happens a lot, so we need to take care of ourselves and ourselves, and realize that our own connection is going to inspire connection in those we work with. Thank you. <laughs>